So thank you for coming along. Um, I'm sure this is going to be an incredibly interesting uh, webinar and I hope that you get a lot out of it. My name is Matt Midler and I'm the fundraising manager here at Waverly Care and I have the pleasure of being your host for this event. I'm joined by three of my inspiring colleagues, Alistair Rose, who is manager of SX Scotland, our service for gay and bisexual men and all men who have sex with men. Margaret Lance, who works with our African and refugee communities affected by HIV across Scotland. And Jenny Jameson, who specialises in working with homeless women at risk of the HIV outbreak in Glasgow. So that you know what to expect, our running order will go something like this. I'll begin with an overview of how Waverly Care has been impacted by COVID-19 and the lockdown. I'll then introduce Alistair, Margaret and Jenny, who will each speak for around about 10 minutes about the work they've been doing and the people they have been supporting. And then we'll highlight the financial impact that the pandemic has had on Waverly Care and explain how you can help. We'll then finish up with around about 15 minutes of questions before ending the event. So I hope that sounds okay to everyone and, um, and that that's what you're expecting. Um, so let's crack on. So for those who might not know Waverly Care so well, we are Scotland's HIV, Hepatitis C and Sexual Health Charity. We employ around 60 staff all across Scotland and before the pandemic, we worked with hundreds of volunteers each year in service delivery, office support and fundraising. Our work broadly fits into three main areas. We are supporting people living with or at risk of HIV and hepatitis C. We are preventing the spread of bloodborne viruses and sexually transmitted infections. And we are influencing through the research and training that we carry out. We work with very diverse communities who, at first glance, may seem very different. However, the one thing they have in common is that they can all face health inequalities and or social, social exclusion in a number of ways in our society. We deliver specialist services to African and refugee communities, gay and bisexual men, injecting drug users and homeless people, women, young people, new mothers, older people who are living with HIV, to name but a few. We work in the cities and we work in rural communities all across Scotland. Our work is long-term and holistic. And what that means is that we will be here for those who need us for as long as they need us. So when in March last year, the national lockdown began, our services had to change drastically. Our offices were forced to close. Most of our face-to-face -face support services had to come to an end. And our in-person support groups were cancelled. And testing clinics run from our offices and in the community were halted. For our service users, this meant no access to sexual health and HIV Hep C testing. Extra barriers to receiving the support that they need with some service users not having regular access or any access to a computer, tablet, internet connection, or even a phone. For many, this meant increased isolation for those who are already isolated or shielding for those with pre-existing health conditions. And as a charity, uh, we faced extra challenges as well. Our IT infrastructure wasn't set up in such a way that all of our staff could work comfortably from home straight away. We had to completely rewrite the way that we deliver our work and at short notice. And of course, the cancellation of the Edinburgh Festival and all of our fundraising events meant that we lost out on around £200,000 of fundraising in the past year. So it has been a challenging year all round, um, but I'm glad to say that we've all been working hard to make sure that those who need us, that we're there for those who need us, and that this, um, and of course this is the purpose of today's webinar, to tell you, our supporters and our partners, 
about the work that we've been doing to support those who need us over the past year. Okay, that's it from me, you'll be pleased to know. Um, I'm now gonna pass over to our first speaker, um, Alistair Rose from Essex. Alistair. Thanks, Matt, for, <coughs> for that introduction. Yeah, um, so as Matt <coughs> highlighted, I am uh, the manager of Essex, which is a service that works with um, gay and bisexual men uh, right across Scotland, from our urban areas uh, in Edinburgh, for example, to rural areas in the likes of Forth Valley and uh, up in Highland as well. So um, I've been working in this field for over 15 years, and I have to say the last year's probably been the most challenging. Um, and it's been the most challenging because our service users and their inequalities they face have been exacerbated by the pandemic. I'm proud of the response that we've delivered as part of Waverly Care. That response has been dynamic and creative. We have looked at different ways to deliver services, and we've done so putting the needs of our population at the front of what we do. So SX has been around at Waverly Care for five years nearly now, and it works as part of the wider organisation. And we put a community focused approach to the work of working with gay and bisexual men and all men who have sex with men. We do so from the premise that our community is probably our greatest asset. So we involve them in our work, we do. And I have to say that has been really challenging over the last, last few months. SX is about gay and bisexual men and men who have sex with men. And like other populations you're going to hear about today, we've carried a burden of inequality for many years, particularly since HIV became, it came on our radar. But the work we do at SX is we're proud. We're proud of who we are as a community and we're proud of the approach we take. We're sex positive in the approach, which means that sex between men should be pleasurable and it shouldn't be something that's stigmatized. We still fight many social inequalities such as poor mental health and substance use that are faced by our our, our population, and we do so by working with the partners right across Scotland. Our mental well-being, like everyone else's, has been impacted massively by the pandemic, and this is a continually impacted by stigma and discrimination, and I'll talk about that a little bit And fundamentally, we want to take an approach as an organisation, but also as part of, 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 of a community, to end that stigma and discrimination, which impacts the mental health, the sexual health and well-being of, of gay and bisexual men. So what has the pandemic meant for us? Well, for a gay community or an LGBT community, we have lost our community spaces. We have lost the spaces where we engage, where we can be open about who we are and, and feel confident about engaging with other people. So that may be the commercial gay hubs, for example, or community spaces such as cafes. But for many people, it has meant they've become more isolated. So, a lot of people would access our services, might be the only contact they have where they can openly talk about being LGBT, or actually even the pub or club that they would use would be another place where they can. So that has meant that the most vulnerable people and isolated people in our society have become even more isolated. We're also seeing an increase in inequalities for our younger populations. Many of our younger gay and bisexual men have had to move back home. Can they be open? at home around who they are and their sexuality and the issues they're facing. Many of us, when we left home, left home and went and experienced a gay scene for the first time and allowed us to express ourselves for who we truly are, that's gone during the pandemic. Those with addictions, which Jenny, I'm sure we'll talk about in more detail later on, are losing the face-to-face -face support to stay on track. And again, bisexual men and men who have sex with men are impacted by addictions, particularly around alcohol and substance use. The loss of safe spaces has led to a deterioration in that connectivity. So the older people in our society have no longer got the place where they can engage with other people. Our mental health as a population has deteriorated significantly, like everyone else as the pandemic has hit. But it has already started from a poor level. Gain bisexual men are one of the most affected by poor mental health. And for us as services, we're sometimes finding it hard to find the right answer for people because sometimes there isn't an answer that we can provide. A lot of our service users are looking for reassurance. Where can they next get their sexual health test? Where can they seek support around their mental health and well-being? That sometimes isn't an answer that we can provide. Other services that people have relied on, such as 
Houtslake, for example, have had to move into different environments and become more online focused. So really we've got quite a, a negative picture what's going on out there. Is it our poor mental health in our community? We have people using more substances such as alcohol. Men are reporting to us that they are a victim of relationship abuse. The sex we have has changed. We can't engage with people like we traditionally used to. As I said earlier on, younger men are not having the same spaces to express their sexuality, perhaps even for the first time. We've become reliant on the online world. And probably with something that's quite pertinent to me is we've spent many years fighting to come out. And recently we've almost had to jump back in because we've had to change the way who we are because of, of, of where we are. So our inequalities haven't stopped because of a pandemic. They exist day in, day out, and they've become even greater for the populations we work with. So in respect to the work of SX, we've had to work dynamically, as Mark has already pointed out. So the way we deliver work had to change pretty much overnight. So our physical delivery of services, such as one-to-one -one support, had to move online. Our testing it had to be delivered digitally and through postal kits because we were no longer in a position to be able to do it physically. So we're proud of the work we've done because in partnership with HIV Scotland, our self-testing reached out to many thousands of people across Scotland when it was the only option to get a test for HIV. Our website has around 1,500 unique users every week who access information ranging from substance use through to this sexual health and well-being and mental health. We continue to provide the best support we can possibly through digital chat and support. We use Zoom calls, we use Teams like every other organisation, but sometimes it limits our ability to deal with complex interventions and deal with people's needs where that physical contact face-to-face is sometimes the best source. So we've had to often become the one-stop shop for our population. We sometimes don't always have the answers, and that is perhaps the hardest thing we've had to do. When people come to us, they've come to us because sometimes the services they traditionally use have stopped or they have changed. As Matt talked about, many people don't have access to IT, though gay and bisexual men by and large have been early adopters of, uh, of technology. Another thing in terms of where we are is our staff and our team in the SX are also members of the LGBT community and are experiencing some of the concerns of our service users, such as not having connectivity in the family. And the biggest question we get asked is what will the future hold? And that's a difficult one because we actually really don't know what the future will hold within this pandemic. So let me tell you about some of our people. Think about the young person who I might have just talked about who needs to speak for us because it's the only way he can connect with other gay men. He might not be able to be open when he's had to move back home because of the pandemic. He might have missed the opportunity to go out clubbing or experiencing what it's like to be a gay man when he went to university because that's gone. That then impacts his experience and his well-being because he's continually having to be someone else who he isn't, who doesn't, who he doesn't want to be. It's effectively going back into the closet. Or what about the person who's experiencing intimate partner violence or sexual assault who connects with us because no other services are there for him to disclose his sexuality and what is happening to him? That is something we are seeing all too often in the work we do. Or what about the person of colour that comes into our services because he can't come out to his community because they won't accept him and needs us as an outlet for his anxiety and the way he lives his life? And perhaps think about the man in his 70s who has lived through all the inequalities as a population that we have through the AIDS crisis in the 80s and 90s, right through to the discrimination that he will have experienced. He's housebound because of the implications of the pandemic and he has no one to talk to when programmes like It's a Sin raise some of the historical and current inequalities that he faces. So the pandemic has impacted us greatly as a, as a population. And I'm proud of what we do with SX. I'm proud of the community-led development approach that we take by working together. We're trying best as we can to make a difference. The one thing we get asked is a lot is reassurance. When are things going to get back to normal? That isn't an answer we can give. But what we can do is continue to be there for people 
and continue to be their point of resource when things are not going well. I've got a great team that I work with. We reach out to people to deliver services, but we do so not knowing ourselves what the pandemic means for our population. So this is a great opportunity to find out more about us, and I urge you to um, look at our website, which is sx.scot, and mention SX to your gay or bisexual male colleagues who might be finding the pandemic a little bit tough. But also be kind to them, because pandemics like this make our inequalities even greater. And most of us are facing real life health and social inequalities already with the pandemics. Eh, the pandemic is exacerbated. And of course, if you can, give to Waverly Care. Thank you, Alistair. I really appreciate that. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Margaret Lance from our African Health Project. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name is Margaret Lanz, and I am the Health Improvement Coordinator for Waverly Care African Health Project, and I'm supporting Africans living with HIV in Glasgow. So before I crack on, I would just like to quickly talk a bit about the African Health Project. The African Health Project started in Edinburgh in 2003, and in 2006, we opened our doors in Glasgow to respond to the number of Africans that were being diagnosed with HIV in Glasgow. So our work is in two phases. We do have our outreach program and we have the support work. For our outreach work, we want to go out and raise HIV awareness through education. We want to educate our people to able to test in order to know their status. Our concern remains with that population of people that could be living with HIV and they don't know that they have HIV. So what we will do is we encourage them through our education programs to have a test. And of course we do have, um, we do go out to carry out these tests in our offices, in our communities and in the churches. Today, my talk is going to focus more on our support work and how the pa pandemic has impacted on our service users. Of course, uh, no one was expecting a, a situation like this. It came as a shock to everyone, so our service users. So there's been fear, anxiety, uncertainty, nobody knew what that is. And of course, we see um, increased loneliness and us, um, isolation within our community. Most of them cut off from uh, friends and family members. Of course, they used to come to the office, which is like a family home for them. And of course, with the pandemic, things had to change. We didn't have uh, our normal face-to-face -face interactions that we would normally um, have. Uh, this restriction of their day-to-day -day activities. And of course, we notice a great, a greater language barrier. So, which means those who um, can speak English or English is not their first language, would find it very difficult in managing their appointments or finding interpreters and reading letters that are being sent to them either from the home office or from the GPs and housing association. Homeschooling became a massive challenge, especially if we're looking at some families with more than one child, how they're gonna support their child and support themselves during this pandemic. And we're also looking at their level of education. How is their level to be able to support their children from home? been quite challenging. Having a mother with three children, having one computer for their children to carry out their assignments 
was was quite difficult. We also noticed that digital inequality was massive and those who even managed to have a phone will not have internet services. Whereas when they used to come to the office, we have free internet access, we could give them chance to use the computers and support them there and then. But now it becomes quite difficult for them to get through to us or for us to reach them um, if they don't have top ups for their phone or if they don't even have a phone at all. There's been increased um, cases of domestic violence, people unable to manage appointments, and of course, massive poverty. There are some of our service users who are living in absolute poverty. Immigration is also a very big challenge because we have most of our service users are asylum seekers, which means that they live in limbo waiting for the home office to decide on their cases. And that can be quite challenging and frustrating. And of course, creates a lot of panic and comes with other health issues. Now, in terms of confidentiality, with lockdown, it has been quite difficult, you know, to communicate with our service users, which means that sometimes it is to think when to talk and when not to talk, because most of them have not disclosed uh, their status. So it's first of all to think, are you okay to talk? Are they okay to talk? Which means that there is a gap because sometimes they may want to say something but cannot say it because of the environment which they find themselves at the time of the call. And of course, we continue to call them to check if they are okay and when they can talk. How has this actually affected the way we deliver our services? As I said earlier on, none of us was expecting the pandemic to come and to come so fast. So what we did was to carry our services, transfer our services online and then working from home. The, the environment that we're working uh, at home and the challenges that come with that. So supporting clients to attend Zoom, first of all, do they have the devices? Do they have internet connection? Have they been, are they, um, are they literate to be able to help themselves digitally? So this being a challenge for them, it has been a challenge for us as well. So some of them would even use their data. Those who can manage to use data, they would use their data. But it means that most of the time the conversation could cut off once their data is finished. We normally would carry our one-to-one -one telephone support with our service users. This is what we have been doing during the pandemic. So we, moving online means that we also have to find other ways that we can continue to support our clients. So our best way that we've been communicating with them is through one-to-one -one telephone support, which is different from the face-to-face uh, contacts and hooks that we would normally have and taking that, you know, most of them don't have family here. So Waverly Care became their family. So to lose that family because of the pandemic has been quite challenging to many of them. And of course, we see that many of our service users are aging with HIV and having other health conditions, which means greater care needs to be provided for them. So what do we do? We would call them if they need anything, if they need food, if they need their phones uh, top up, if they need their medications picked up or rearrange their appointments, we will do that for them. And of course, we work in collaboration with the Center for Infectious Diseases, which means that if there is any issue that we are finding with our client, we would work with the Center for Infectious Diseases 
If anyone misses their appointment, we will double check and follow up to find out why they missed their appointments, did they forget, or the Center uh, for Infectious Diseases will contact us to let us know that somebody missed their appointment and we will chase them up because uh, we know that most of them have got multiple complex issues and mental health, they can forget their medication, other issues, they can forget. So we will chase them up to ensure that they are fine, that they are taking their medication. Uh, if they need food provided for them, we will do. And one thing that we did during the, we do, sorry, excuse me, we did during the pandemic, and of course we continue to do, is to ensure that breastfeeding mothers have got enough milk for their children. So uh, we work with the mothers from when they are pregnant until when they give birth and continue to work with them. So we will provide four tins of milk per month times 12. So if we have a mother who's got twins, it therefore means that we're going to provide eight tins of milk a month times 12. And the milk is quite expensive, but of course our babies are more expensive. So we actually invest in them. And of course, confidentiality still, as I said earlier on, it's still the key because we want to work with our service users and ensure that we continue to maintain their uh, confidentiality. We work with them in a way that they are comfortable, that they are not stigmatized which is what we encourage everyone to do. So I would just quickly like to talk about some of the challenges that our service users are having. As I said, immigration is at the top. There is uh, poverty, which is quite high. We have seen um, increased levels of uh, mental health, poor mental health in our clients. Uh, we have some with mobility issues, but I'm going to talk just about a, one case. And we know that some the cope very well and some not too well, having the good days and the bad days. So our telephone conversations are working very well to ensure that we are following them up all the time. And I'm taking a case in point here of a client, an asylum seeker, with heart issues, visually impaired, and still in absolute denial of coming to terms with um, her, her condition. So it is our duty to continuously assure her. It's just about the reassurance. All our service users, we reassure them to let them understand that we are here, we care, and we will do everything in our power to continue to support them, no matter what. And of course, this is as a result of teamwork. During the pandemic, the teams have been really, really great in supporting one another, in sharing information and what to do. You just contact and the management has also been very, very, very and of course, we need to give gratitude to our partners because we couldn't have done this by ourselves. And our peer mentors as well, our peer mentors have been really helpful because they have been there and they are supporting others to follow the same, not to, you know, uh, relent. And of course, what I would like to say is that um, some of the issues we try to resolve with the little resources that we have, and some of them are ongoing, but we are doing our best with the resources we have to ensure that we continue to provide the best services to our clients. Thank you very much. Thank you, Margaret. I really appreciate that. That was really informative. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce our third speaker, Jenny Jameson from the Waverly Care HIV Street Support Team. Jenny. Hi there, thank you. Um, right, yep. 
So I work for the HIV Street Support Service in Glasgow, um, and this was set up about three years ago in response to the HIV outbreak amongst people who use drugs in the city centre. And these are primarily injecting drug users who are homeless. So by homeless, I mean on the streets or in temporary accommodation. Um, injecting drug use carries increased risk of um, bloodborne virus through the sharing of needles and paraphernalia. And there's lots of reasons people end up sharing. Um, desperation, addiction is very powerful. Um, ignorance around the risks. We often come across a fatalistic attitude Bloodborne viruses might be very low on the list of priorities for someone who's homeless with addiction problems. So, you know, some people are surprised that they've lived to their 40s. And um, so life on the streets is pretty grim. And um, so we need to consider the root causes as to why people end up on the streets using drugs. And some of the, these causes are a lifetime of poverty, childhood trauma might be in the mix, abuse, domestic violence, gender-based violence, bereavements, loss, you name it. Um, and, and the trauma of being on the streets. So using drugs and alcohol helps take the edge off that. So why the specific need for a women's worker, you might wonder. Well, there's evidence and research indicates that women who use drugs in Glasgow are disproportionately affected by the HIV outbreak. And across Scotland, women who inject drugs are three times more likely to be HIV positive than their male counterparts. And this remains the case even after accounting for other risk factors such as age, homelessness and injecting cocaine use. So, right, injecting cocaine is one of the main drivers of this outbreak. Um, it has to be injected much more frequently as the buzz is so short lived. So this increases the risk of bloodborne virus transmission and infections um, massively. Um, so what does my team's job look like on a practical level? Well, there is three main areas. So there's street work and there's testing in services. And we also carry a caseload of individuals for one to one work. Um, for the street work, we approach homeless people who are begging on the streets and we offer blood testing and harm reduction services. So we go out we, and we carry big backpacks with all our equipment in them. In it, um, The harm reduction side of it, we offer clean needles in, in the form of these one hit kits, which contains I'm going to hold it up. Um, everything someone might need to inject with syringe and spoon and citric acid. Um, there's also water for injections we include in the kit. Um, sharps, bends, foils as well, which are um, aluminium foil, but it's it's not got the foil you buy from a, sh a shop, like you're cooking for bacon or whatever. It's got a um, it's got oil treated with oil, so that's really bad for folks' lungs. So this this is um, better. Um, we always try to promote the smoking of drugs over injecting because it's less risky. Um, we have condoms and femidoms to reduce transmission through um, sex. And we also carry naloxone, um, which is, this has got a syringe with the naloxone liquid in it. Naloxone is an opiate inhibitor, so it reverses um, the effect of overdose. And on two separate occasions, I've been involved in administering this to individuals overdosing on the street. So. When we offer these things, it gives us a way in to have conversations about health and about safety and also to refer people on to specialist services where needed um, so, so that they can access the health and the health care that they're entitled to and that they deserve. Um, it's really important here to highlight that we have connections and we work in collaboration with other services. So, for example, the NHS, the Bloodborne Virus and Sexual Health Outreach Nurses, um, also the Outreach Pharmacists, our own Hep C team um, and homeless services as well. So there's a recognition that services need to be brought to, to this group because they're so marginalised and due to the chaotic nature of life on the streets, it's really hard for a homeless drug user to engage with clinics in the traditional sense. There's, there's loads of barriers there for them. So that brings me on to testing. Um, there's two types of blood tests we offer. They're both finger prick tests, but they're different. There's the point of care test, which is the HIV test, and the results come back in roughly 10 minutes. And this is great because it can be done on the street really quickly. The results can be delivered quickly, which can streamline getting people into treatment faster. Um, the other one's the DBS test, the dry blood spot test, and that we use to test for HIV and Hep C. 
it's a paper test. You've got to fill the five discs with blood and it does take a bit longer and it's a bit trickier to complete outside. You need to consider Glasgow's weather if it's raining and blowing a gale. Um, and it also takes two weeks for the results of them to come back. And so a lot of our clients, they might have no fix the board. So consideration needs to be taken regarding how to track the person doing the game and to deliver their results. Um, with testing and services, as part of the outreach service, we go into different services out with the city centre as well. So that might be rehab centres, the women's refuges, temporary accommodation as well. And, and also we um, have access to the van, the needle exchange van that we can go out um, to different locations and do testing as well. Um, our one-to-one -one work, this is longer term. So we never close a person's case per se. Um, and what we find is when somebody reaches a more stable place in their life and their drug use is more manageable, then this is when all that body trauma starts rising to the surface and they need more support. Um, and they're in a better position then to take the support. It's also really worth highlighting here that there is greater compliance in treatment if there's support in place for that person in the longer term as well. Because I touched on how um, BBVs might be quite low on somebody's priority when there's so many other things in their life that, that need sorted out first. Um, so what's the impact of lockdown on people we support ha is um, as much as what Alistair and Mary have touched on, it's just it's made things even harder for them. Like They're even more isolated and folks' mental health is suffering even further. Um, for homeless people, though, there's if there's less footfall on the street. So this means less money is being made begging. Um, people we support, some of the, they still have drug habits to pay for. So it does beg the question of what are people being forced to do um, to get their drugs? Um, so there is this increased risk of prostitution and exploitation and an increase um, in the criminal behavior. Um, so I'll just move on to the next bit. Um, people also, so, so, so people have been scooped up off the streets and they've been housed in hotels. So that really shows what can be done. But I want us to really remember that this was about, that was about COVID. Uh, it wasn't about individual um, needs and they weren't looking at individual risk either. So there's positives and negatives of that. Some of the positives are that healthcare staff now know where these people are. Um, although some of the negatives are that people can feel unsafe and um, they might have been accommodated with people that they would rather avoid and there has been reports from women of an increased instances of gender-based violence um, and there's also been um, multiple deaths from accidental overdoses and it's also made access and services much more difficult and that was really hard for this group anyway okay in terms of how lockdown measures have changed the way we work um, initially, a lot of our street work and testing was suspended, but none of our clients' issues were going away. So we had to look at how we adapted to get back out there. Um, and, and it was at a reduced capacity initially, but this is building up again. Um, so that involves us updating policy and procedure and trying to figure out how to safely continue to work. So we have PPE requirements and testing in service now requires risk assessments around space and ventilation and how to safely socially distance as well. Um, when we're not out doing street work and outreach work, we're now working from home. Um, so there's more remote support and phone support in place. Um, but that's difficult because many of our clients, they don't have phones um, and or, or often their phones, their numbers are changing quite often. And we're also supporting people with really, really complex needs. Um, and it can be difficult to leave these things at work when you're now working in your own home. So that's taken a bit of getting used to as well. Um, during street work, um, myself and my colleague, we um, an example of how we've supported somebody during the pandemic would be um, we approached the people who was begging on the street. And initially she was quite guarded. Um, and upon explaining our service and harm reduction work, she soon opened up and she informed us that she'd recently had all her blood tests in, done in hospital. But it transpired she'd been sleeping rough and she was waiting to be given a date to go for an operation in the hospital. And her mobility was quite limited due to various physical ailments she had. So she was really grateful to access our needle exchange and it saved her struggling to try and get to the pharmacy herself. 
Um, and while we were doing the exchange, it kind of allowed us to find out a bit more about her situation. And actually, the blood tests at the hospital weren't very recent at all, and she had been at risk since. So, so she agreed for us to test her again, sort of there and then. Um, but what we could also do in that moment was we could refer her on to the appropriate housing supports and we were also able to secure her accommodation for that night so she wouldn't be sleeping rough again. Um, and then they could, the housing supports could work on a longer term plan for her. And this also meant that we could track her in more easily in order to deliver her results. And all of this happened because of a of outreach. Um, so I don't know what would have happened to that lady otherwise. Um, in terms of one-to-one -one work, it's been hard um, not being able to have the face-to-face -face contact um, during the pandemic. Um, you know, you're trying to build a relationship at times with someone you've maybe never seen. Um, in one instance, I supported a woman fleeing violence to move house, having never met them in person. Um, so that involved quote, like a lot of really intense interagency working and making sure every every all the agencies were joined up and communicating with each other so so yeah by supporting us um, you're not only going to help us in our crisis intervention work but you're also going to help us in our longer term work to promote the message that it's not good enough just to get people into treatment in in order for treatment to be effective there has to be a holistic approach to providing people with that social emotional and practical support so that people feel valued and they actively want to invest in their own health. Um, yeah, so I think and that's me. That's me done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. Well done. That was really, really informative. Um, OK, we are going to finish with um, about 10 minutes at the end for questions. Um, but before we move on to that, it would be uh, remiss of me as fundraising manager at Waverly Care um, to not top off the, the talks with a little bit uh, of information about how our finances have been impacted um, as a charity by the pandemic. Um, so as you can see, the team at Waverly Care have been working hard throughout the pandemic um, to make sure that we are continuing to be there for those who need us during this difficult time. But one of the most challenging things has been the impact on the charity's finances. So when lockdown was announced, we knew that would mean financial difficulties. And to put that into context, around about 70% of the money that we would usually raise through fundraising from the public is generated through events, bucket shakes, and the support of theatres and festivals, all things that had to come to an end uh, during lockdown. As I said before, um, we lost out on about £200,000, which was wiped from our budget um, as soon as lockdown was announced. And with lockdown continuing into 2021, we're relying on the kindness of the public more than ever. So I wanted to quickly mention two ways that you can support Waverly Care today. Firstly, we have launched a campaign to recruit at least 50 people to take part in the Kilt Walk at the end of April. We are halfway there. We've recruited 25, but we're still looking for 25 fundraisers to step up and take on the challenge. If this could be you, then we want to hear from you. Secondly, if a physical challenge isn't um, the type of thing that you're into, um, then you could make a regular donation to Waverly Care. So as little as five pounds a month could make a huge difference in the long term. So more information about signing up to the Kilt Walk or pledging a donation can be found on our website. I'll also include details in the follow-up email or if you're watching on another platform, the details will be down below. Okay. Um, and finally, just to say, uh, and I know that we do have some supporters and donors watching, if you're already uh, supporting Waverly Care, then please know that we are so grateful for your support. Okay, thank you. Now, we've got 10 minutes more um, for questions. I'm going to bring everybody back in, my beautiful colleagues. And um, we've got some questions here um, from the attendees. Okay, so um, Ro had asked um, to Jenny, how has your relationship with food banks across Scotland changed because of COVID? 
Oh, massively increased. We're getting loads and loads more folk needing to access them. And it's an act, and actually because food banks are you know they're, they're quite often quite small organizations that have just set up there's no there's no directory really for food banks it, it involves just access one food parcel for somebody can involve quite a lot of groundwork just trying to find somewhere that's that's open or that or whether that parcel needs delivered if the person quite often a lot of our clients might have mobility issues so they maybe can't go and pick it up um so yeah it can take so hugely there's been a huge increase sadly and has there been um, has there been an impact on the availability of of um, essentials from food banks, or has the supply been been okay to date? At the start of COVID, then there was a sort of I think there's a lot more in place. It's it's getting trickier now. I think there's less availability laterally, or it's harder to access. I think now, definitely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, Alistair, I wonder if um, this is one you might want to address. Uh, there are some, this is from Ian, there are some concerns that some people living with HIV um, will be missed by the COVID vaccine problem, uh, program, particularly young people. Some clinics are providing uh, the vaccine and some aren't. Uh, are Waverly Care planning any intervention to provide COVID vaccinations? So <clears throat> Waverly Care isn't the organisation that provide COVID vaccinations, that has to be done through clinical approaches such as um, GP rollout. Um, what you're I quite say, quiet, Alistair, sorry, just to say sorry. you're quite quiet. Um, so what I would say, you hear me now? Yeah. So I think, so just basically what I was saying there is, it's not, it's not, it, COVID vaccinations have been done by clinical people such as your GPs, doctors and health boards. Um, so, it's not for us to provide these interventions. What I would say though is, is have discussions, if you're living with HIV, have discussions with your HIV clinician to talk about it and understand if it's if you are needing to be uh, prioritized for a COVID vaccination because of HIV in the first instance and have that discussion with them. I think it's, um, it's very different in different parts of the country at the moment of what's happening with, with vaccinations. So it has to be really implemented locally is what I would say to that. Um, but I would, but I would say, I take this opportunity that for people living with HIV, um, the vaccination program is something that people should engage with because it's a really important thing to do. And at the moment, there's stuff that the British Association of Sexual Health and, and organisations like them have, have talked about around if there's any risk. And at the moment, we're seeing no real reason for people living with HIV provided they don't have other medical conditions, not to take the vaccine. So vaccines are a really important tool for people to do. So while I can't give guarantees to Ian's answer there, I think it's um, encourage people to engage with their local clinicians if possible. Thank you. Um, and Margaret, you'd mentioned that many of uh, our African and refugee uh, service users who are living with HIV um, may be living with people who uh, are not aware of their HIV status um, and there are concerns around stigma. Just wanted to ask what, what can be the impact of that on, on the service user um, you know when, when they're dealing with uh, the fear of stigma um, and trying to access support but also trying to, to you know to keep their status under wraps. Well thank you. I would rather say that the first point I would like to highlight is that of adherence uh, if people are hiding their medication, if they can't talk openly about their condition, it therefore would affect adherence to their medications. And also it's because of the stigma and stigma, I mean, stigma is the killer. It's not the virus that kills. It's the way people judge you for who you are, for the condition that you have. So it also creates a lot of anxiety and uh, of course, depression. It comes with all those things. So to answer that again, I would like to, you know, say clearly out there that we need to be supportive. People living with HIV, they don't need our pity. All they need is our, our support so that they can be able to come out and know that they are loved for who they are. Thank 
It's about asking them the right question. Have you had, have you taken your medications? When is your next appointment? Have you eaten? Just same, that's part of our work with our outreach work with organizations. You may be in housing, but you don't see what has HIV got to do with housing. Of course, it's got a lot. If you are supporting someone with a condition, they have to be comfortable enough to open up and tell you that, oh, this person's been so nice to me. I don't need to hide, I'll just tell you. But if you have the knowledge, then you can support that person. But if you don't have the knowledge, you may keep quiet and keeping quiet, it, it's also another thing. Oh, you're keeping quiet, they're judging me. I just told her and nothing has happened. So we need to know the facts. Once we know the facts, we are able to provide support to the people that come to us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we've got a question from Craig and I'll just open this up to whoever uh, wants to answer this question. Craig asks, how has COVID-19 impacted the number of people um, starting to use services um, for the first time, I assume, uh, or changed the way that people are first coming into contact with our services? Um, if you want, I'll go just now. So I think we are we're, we're definitely seeing people in terms of accessing our questions increasing and increasing with more complex issues. So coming to us around, you know, their, their mental health is particularly really being affected by the lockdown and how it's impacting them. Um, issues around, you know, sexual assault, for example. You, you know, so we're seeing these people coming in and, and services and the loss of community spaces, which is so important to any minority group, is the loss of community connection. Um, losing them are really impacting on how people are coming into our services and the the issues that they're presenting with. And then we've got things like um, routine testing, which we've had to change the way people access testing. So moving online to access testing, you know, uh, to provide a bit of breathing space to the statutory or NHS services who frankly have worked amazingly to try and embed services during this pandemic and um, to try and give them a bit of breathing space so they can now start to get into place where they can take over. So I think, we're seeing people, new people coming into contact with us all the time, different presenting issues. And um, definitely, definitely, um, we are under a lot more strain in terms of, you know, resources to be able to meet their needs because the needs for these other issues that might routinely go to other services are under so much pressure as well. Thank you. Um, and finally, there was a question, um, and again, I'll open this open this to the room. What has been the impact of the programme? It's a sin, which of course has been in the media a lot, and there's been a lot of hype around it. Um, the drama that, that kind of dramatised one group of friends' experience of um, the uh, AIDS epidemic in the, in the 1980s. Um, how has that impacted uh, Waverly Care or the, the way that people are thinking about HIV? Uh, today in, in our communities? Um, so I'll just jump in first, um, as always. Um, what <laughs> I would say is there's been sort of, it's, it's been a brilliant programme. What it has done, it has done what other programmes or other things around HIV and AIDS hasn't done. It has actually told the real story, the real story of impact of stigma and discrimination in society and how society reacted to that pandemic at that time and what it made people feel like because of their identity. So many of the stuff that Jenny and Margaret have talked about is actually really prevalent then. And sadly, it's still prevalent now. There's still discrimination and stigma about living with HIV. And we talk about equality and we talk about where we've moved to as a population and as, as a society, that people are still stigmatised because they're living with HIV. And we need to move that on. I think the other thing very quickly is it's made older gays like myself I think um, actually it's opened quite a lot of, um, I was going to say wounds, but I wouldn't say it's wounds. It's, um, it's allowed us to reflect on, on the journey we've been through to get where we are today. So things like PrEP, for example, that's been done because of the activism, these people that were portrayed in that programme and the health staff and the people who really engaged with HIV to try and make change. So we are now living in a very different world in terms of how the virus works. But that is because of communities 
coming together with health providers to make that happen. And the advent of, advent of treatment has made such a difference. So, which is why it's really important. We get people tested and we get people on, on treatment because the picture of HIV is so different. And actually, as Margaret, I think, highlighted the biggest impact is stigma. And we have to challenge that. So if you can all take that away from today, challenge the stigma around HIV. Perfect. Thank you. OK, it's now nine o'clock, so I, I promised I was going to finish up as close to nine as possible. Um, so it's just one minute past, so um, I'm going to take 30 seconds of your time to say a huge thank you um, to all of our speakers, Alistair, Margaret and Jenny, who um, took time out of their day and got up extra early um, ahead of a busy day, I'm sure, uh, to come along and speak. And uh, of course, I will be doing the same thing again this afternoon at one o'clock. Um, I'd like to also say a huge thank you to Holly, who has been um, doing all the technical stuff behind the scenes for us. We couldn't have done it without Holly. Um, and finally, a huge thank you to all of you for coming along, for showing an interest in the work of Waverly Care and showing support for people affected by HIV, uh, hepatitis C and sexual health across Scotland. Um, I hope we've provided some interest and some inspiration for you. If you haven't already, please do sign up for our newsletter or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter or LinkedIn to keep up to date with all that's happening here at Waverley Care. So on behalf of everybody we work with, thank you and do keep in touch. Goodbye.